I think I know maybe a fourth of the room. Um, so that's nice. Um, and I don't know how you heard about this symposium, but Paul and I and the rest of, of the team actually has um, decided to come up with the symposium just because of the um, pulmonary conditions that are present in the community and the great number of patients we have who are yearning for uh, further education and as well as interaction with, with other patients who have the same diseases as them. So thank you for coming. Um, typically when I give lectures to healthy ages, I usually touch on asthma and COPD, but today I'm going to talk about pulmonary vascular disease. So the lungs have a blood supply and on top of that it's actually enmeshed in a very intricate network of blood vessels that's responsible for gas exchange so how we exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide that's predominantly um, dependent on our pulmonary vasculature okay the heart and the lungs are intimately connected um, and whenever the heart fails, the lungs will feel ill as well. And at the same time, whenever the heart fails, the lungs will feel short of breath and sick too. Um, so the blood that our body uses up, and um, as you know, different parts of your body use up oxygen, muscles, the heart, the brain, etc. The used up blood actually goes into our blood vessels, so the big veins of the body, the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. Those are the big veins that drain the lower half and most of the upper parts of the body and the head. Um, that blood, which is already devoid of oxygen because the tissues have already used them, go into the right side of your heart, your right artery and into the right ventricle. Then the blood actually goes into your pulmonary artery. And the pulmonary artery distribute the blood into the lungs, where blood that doesn't have oxygen get oxygen again, and where carbon dioxide actually goes out and you breathe out carbon dioxide eventually. And when the lungs are done with its job of trying to exchange oxygen carbon and carbon dioxide, that oxygenated blood is, goes back into the pulmonary veins and into the left side of the heart. Um, the left atrium, the left ventricle, and out into your aorta where it goes out again into the system where it supplies different parts of your body with oxygen. And then the same cycle happens again. So any diseases that would interrupt that flow or would cause abnormality in that flow may end up causing pulmonary vascular disease. And that's why the heart as well plays a very important role in that um, disease process. Okay, so normally the right side of the heart has very low pressures, not like our systemic blood pressure. Um, our systemic blood pressure usually runs in the 100 teens, 120s. If we have high blood pressure, it may go up more than 140 systolic, right? Everyone understands that concept, I'm hoping, um, which is very different with the low pressure area which is in the right side of the lung. Um, as, I, as, I, as I mentioned earlier on, the deoxygenated blood goes into the right side of the heart and then enters the pulmonary artery where it goes into the lungs where oxygen goes in, carbon dioxide goes out, carbon dioxide is exhaled. Okay. All right. So this is just a very nice description of the normal pressures and the, within your systemic blood vessels and within the blood vessels of your lungs. Okay. All right. And then this is a close-up view of what your pulmonary blood vessels look like. They're enmeshed actually just right outside of your alveoli. So the alveoli is the air sac. Whenever you breathe air, the air goes into your breathing tubes, your bronchi is what we call them, and into the smallest ones. We call that the terminal bronchiole. And then from there, it goes into the air sacs where gas exchange occurs. And part of that gas exchange occur because of the meshwork of blood vessels that's um, within that area, just right outside the alveoli. So these are very thin structures 
that allows carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange. Um, this is the heart, again another illustration of the heart. A young heart looks really nice and pristine and everything is thin. Your blood vessels have thin walls, etc. Smooth muscle cells within the blood vessels are nice and thin and not thickened up versus an aging lung or an aging heart where blood vessels tend to be thickened as well as filled with plaque which can happen with you know, elevated cholesterol levels, smoking, et cetera. And you know, uh, an older heart also can give shortness of breath and can give rise to pulmonary vascular disease. Okay. So part of pulmonary vascular diseases would be clots that form in the legs and in the lungs. So what is, let's first define terms. So deep vein thrombosis, what is thrombosis? Thrombosis is formation of a blood clot within a blood vessel, preventing adequate flow of blood. Um, this may happen in a vein. And as I've said, uh, the vein brings blood back to the heart. It's normally thin-walled. Or this can happen in an artery, which brings blood from the heart into different parts of the body. And the artery is typically thicker-walled and has higher pressures. Um, so a clot can occur in a vein. That's when deep vein thrombosis occurs. So that's an example of a clot happening within a vein. And then for people who have had stroke, so that's usually a clot within the artery of the brain. Now, what is embolism? Embolism is a clot that travels from where it was formed into another part of the body. So in the case of a clot within the lower legs, of a person, that clot can travel into the lungs, which makes it an embolism. Okay. All right. Any questions for me right now? Okay, so I will proceed. Okay. So we have superficial and deep veins of the legs. What really matters are the deep veins, just because of the fact that clot formation in the deep veins may actually go into your lungs. Um, some examples of the deep veins are your tibial, popliteal, femoral, iliac veins, and then the superficial veins are your saphenous, lesser and greater veins. Um, the superficial veins usually um, travel on its own and are not accompanied by big arteries. The larger, deeper veins are, usually have a corresponding artery to them. What are clots made of? Clots are usually are formed from platelets and a meshwork of protein predominantly composed of fibrin. So this is actually good because this is how we stop bleeding. If we get injured on our skin, if we get stabbed by a knife, um, it's usually the platelets and the, the proteins that actually come and are elicited by that injury that help clot formation which prevent us from bleeding. However, if it abnormally forms within a blood vessel, that can be dangerous and it definitely can be life-threatening. Okay. So this is just a picture of what a blood clot looks like. These are just fat cells. These are red blood cells. The little strands, those are actually fibrin. And then the yellow stuff, those are your platelets. There are risk factors in developing clotting in your legs. Um, of course, if you have an inherited blood clotting disorder, such as I'm sure people have heard of factor V laden deficiency. If you have been at, in bed rest or have been in the hospital for a long period of time that you haven't gotten the chance to walk around or if you've been paralyzed, that's a definite risk. Those who are injured or have surgery. So for those of you guys who have had knee surgery, if you recall, if you remember, they typically would put you on blood thinners to make sure you don't develop clots. Um, pregnant people, because of elevated uh, levels of estrogen, uh, typically are at risk for clot formation, as well as those who are on birth control pills. Cancers, in general, do increase your risk of developing clots, <laughs> as well as heart failure. Um, <laughs> People who are on the heavier side 
people who actively smoke, people who have actually traveled for more than three hours on a plane or in a car may develop clots in their legs. And of course, unfortunately, the older we get, the more predisposed we are to developing clots. Okay. All right, so what are the signs and symptoms of a deep vein thrombosis, a clot within the deep veins of our legs? Usually <laughs> swelling of the involved leg. You may also have pain, and you may also develop warmth and tenderness of that leg. Um, for, for certain people, you can actually feel knots on the back of their legs, on their calves, um, who, if they do have uh, deep vein thrombosis. Okay. How do we prevent blood clots when traveling? Um, we encourage patients to walk every hour, to stretch and wiggle your toes, and you know, stretch your legs, hydrate, make sure you're well hydrated. The air on the airplanes are, are, are very, it is very dry, and so we tend to get dehydrated more as well. Um, avoid alcohol and do not smoke. And then if you are at higher risk of developing blood clots, especially in a prolonged flight, you may wanna ask your primary care provider um, or even your cancer doctor if you, if you do have underlying cancer, whether or not you should be put on preventative medication for the blood clot or if you have to just wear a compression stocking just to help prevent that. Okay. okay, so the reason why we're so concerned about deep vein thrombosis is because the clots that form in the legs can actually travel into the lungs um, and that becomes pulmonary embolism. The science of, a pul of, the science of pulmonary embolism is very similar to general you know pu a general pulmonary condition because shortness of breath is probably one of the more common symptoms of pulmonary embolism if you knew that you just recently traveled or you knew that you may have had or have symptoms of a clot on the legs then that certainly increases the likelihood that yes you may have um, pulmonary embolism people who have pulmonary embolism that are big enough can actually get dizzy and lightheaded and can even collapse and have um, some sort of heart attack. And I say heart attack in quotation marks um, because it's not really an intrinsic issue, issue to the heart, but it, it is a result of impaired circulation within, within the lungs and in the rest of the body. So you can actually collapse because of it if it's a clot that's big enough. Um, if you have an associated clotting on the legs, um, you'll also have skin tenderness, warmth, and swelling of that affected leg. So this is a picture of what a pulmonary embolism looks like. So you have a clot coming from the lower legs, um, from, the deep vein of, from the deep veins of the legs. That becomes an embolism as it travels into the right side of your heart, because remember that's where the deoxygenated venous blood drain into. And then that clot eventually lodges into the pulmonary artery, which supplies your lungs. Okay. And so if it's if it lodges big enough, it impairs your, um, your circulation significantly enough, and you may actually end up with a life-threatening disease. And so that's certainly very important to note. Okay. How do we treat a deep vein thrombosis and how do we treat pulmonary embolism? Um, first of all, what we do is to start them on blood thinners. Um, when they're hospitalized, when they're significant enough, when their clinical symptoms are significant enough that they're hospitalized, uh, we start them on heparin or um, low molecular weight heparin, which is an injection. And then ultimately before they actually get discharged, we start them on an oral medication, whether or not it's warfarin or the newer oral anticoagulants like Xarelto or Eliquis. Um, now, there has to be a decision point. We have to decide as your clinicians, as your providers, whether or not you deserve to be just on a short-term anticoagulant or if you need to be on long-term um, blood thinners. And that's something that you have to discuss with the primary care doctors, depending on what your risk factors are and whether or not this is your first, second, or third blood clot. Okay. People who've had pulmonary, pulmonary embolism can develop pulmonary hypertension. So I'll discuss that in just a bit. Um, 
And then a certain percentage of people may actually have recurrent pulmonary embolism or a failure of treatment. Um, and then there are those, a large portion of which um, actually have resolution of the disease if the underlying risk factors are addressed. Any questions for me at this point about this particular topic? No. Okay. All right. <laughs> So the more common pulmonary vascular disease that we probably have heard about um, is pulmonary hypertension. Um, so does any, is anyone familiar with pulmonary hypertension in the crowd? Yeah, yeah, oh, okay. Oh, I'm just, my question is whether or not the rest of the audience is familiar with pulmonary hypertension. I know, Dorothy, you are. So, <laughs> okay, all right. So what is blood pressure? Blood pressure is actually the force or tension that the blood exerts within our blood vessels. So typically, the smaller the blood vessels, the higher the pressure is, the higher the tension. Um, now, as I've mentioned earlier on, the normal systemic blood pressure, the blood pressure that they measure in our arms, are about 120 over 80. It can go up higher than that if you have um, high blood pressure. But the normal blood pressure within the lungs, the blood vessels of the lungs, is usually very low, below about 20 millimeters mercury, which is very low systolic. Um, people develop pulmonary hypertension because of several different reasons. We classify these patients into certain groups. Group one, patients who, are, who have pulmonary hypertension usually have abnormal pulmonary arterial thickening, so there's remodeling of their arteries. These are patients who typically come in with autoimmune diseases that cause pulmonary hypertension, such as Sjogren's or uh, scleroderma, um, lupus. Um, patients who have had uh, methamphetamine use can actually fall into the group one pulmonary hypertension group. And then um, people who just have pulmonary hypertension without us knowing the reason why. So these are the idiopathic ones. Um, group, the, Another class or group of people who have pulmonary hypertension, hypertension are those who have cardiac diseases like heart failure, valvular heart disease, um, diastolic heart disease. Their hearts cannot relax as much as they should. And so what happens is that the higher pressures on the left side of the heart get reflected back onto the right, and the right side of the heart actually develop high pressures, which also gets reflected into the pulmonary blood vessels. People who are in group three are those who have underlying um, chronic hypoxemia, people who have had need for oxygen for a long time, people who have end-stage COPD, people who have pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease, and those who have untreated sleep apnea. Um, and so I don't know if you have, um, had, have been asked questions about sleep apnea, but we now insist that this gets addressed and treated because it can develop into um, pulmonary hypertension in the future. Um, people who have chronic venothromboembolic disease, so people who have chronic clotting disorders um, in the lungs, within the lungs, fall into group four. Um, and then people who have other types of issues, people who have certain types of cancer, people who have chronic kidney disease fall into the group five category. Okay. So the pathology of pulmonary hypertension is really based on remodeling of the small blood vessels within your lungs. Um, certain types of chemical reactions occur within um, the lining of the walls of your pulmonary arteries, and with that, the musculature thickens, and even the lining of your um, uh, small blood vessels within the lungs actually thicken as well, which increase your blood pressure within the lungs. Okay. So this is sort of just a... Um, I think that this is a very good figure of uh, the different classes of, of pulmonary hypertension um, because remember there's, there's not just one pulmonary blood vessel, it sort of becomes the capillaries and then the pulmonary vein and then it goes into the heart. So within that spectrum, disease can actually develop depending on the class that you have. So pulmonary uh, hypertension group one, 
usually have an abnormality within the pulmonary artery in comparison with pulmonary hypertension group 2, which usually have an issue with the pulmonary veins, which is closer to the left side of the heart because their pulmonary hypertension is predominantly from their heart issues. What are the symptoms of pulmonary hypertension? 86% um, report some short, shortness of breath. 27% um, report fatigue, generalized weakness. 22% um, report some sort of chest pain. And then they may end up getting swelling of the legs as well. They also can report lightheadedness and fainting. And then 13%, about 13% uh, of them may report some form of palpitations, like irregular heartbeat. We also classify people who have pulmonary hypertension depending on how much they can do. So um, the World Health Organization has come up with a functional classification of pulmonary hypertension. Those in functional group class one typically have no issues in their day-to-day -day life. Um, those in class two have some discomfort um, with their usual activity. So walking up an incline, climbing a flight of stairs, et cetera, that would make them short of breath. Um, those in three have shortness of breath with usual activities um, that are minimal, such as walking across the room, um, loading the dishwasher, et cetera. And those with uh, class four disease have shortness of breath even at rest. Um, the specialists who um, take care of pulmonary hypertension patients found it really important to classify groups of patients into the kinds of symptoms that they have because treatment is not offered throughout the classes. It's only offered when you're already in class two to four. Um, all of the medications that we know of are double-edged swords, so they will not only benefit, but it can, they can also harm patients. So we have to decide, um, we have to be very wise with our decision in treating these patients. Okay. So how do we diagnose pulmonary hypertension? First, we have to determine what the pulmonary arterial pressures are, and there are invasive and non-invasive ways of determining that. Um, and then we have to identify any secondary causes. Um, Non-invasive tests would usually comprise of an EKG and an echocardiogram, an ultrasound of your heart. Um, we do want to identify cardiac issues that play a role in the elevated pulmonary pressures. And then we also want to rule out or identify pulmonary disease. So we would order a pulmonary function test or a breathing test. Um, and we would also order some form of imaging of the chest. Um, we would also want to rule out any form of chronic pulmonary clots um, and we, with that, we would order um, a ventilation perfusion scanning, which is a type of nuclear test that would look for chronic clots or do a CT angiography of the lungs. And then, as, um, as I've mentioned earlier, obstructive sleep apnea has become an important cause for pulmonary hypertension, and so we would want to identify those who have sleep apnea and treat them accordingly. If somehow, and part of the diagnosis of Part of the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension really involved um, the invasive test, which is a right heart catheterization. So that determines the pulmonary arterial pressure within um, your pulmonary arteries, and it also determines how big the left side of the heart is contributing to your disease process. So this is an example of, of the, how a pulmonary catheter is inserted. We usually go, in our institution, we usually go into your internal jugular vein. We float a catheter into there that has a balloon on the tip. We let it float. We let it wedge onto the pulmonary artery. And then we get pressure, we get pressures within the pulmonary um, artery as well as in the right atrium and the right ventricle. And we interpret the results um, and determine whether or not you have pulmonary hypertension. All right. And based on the numbers and the other tests that we've done, we would then have to classify you into the different groups. So is the pulmonary hypertension because of just chronic hypoxia from COPD? Is it because of pulmonary fibrosis, et cetera? And part of the reason why pulmonologists want to identify 
pulmonary hypertension is because even if we control your COPD or control the progression of your pulmonary fibrosis, if your pulmonary arterial pressure is high, definitely more than normal, you will still feel some sense of shortness of breath. You're not going to feel normal unless we somehow addressed, we somehow addressed right-sided heart pressure elevation. So that's part of the reason why we take a look at the right side of the heart in chronic lung disease. So this is a very busy slide, um, and this just illustrates how complex the workup of pulmonary hypertension can be. This is sort of an algorithm that we follow, um, but again, pulmonary hypertension can be from so many things that we have to listen to each patient's story and try to figure out what the most likely culprit is. Um, if it's a younger patient, if it's a 25-year-old woman who has symptoms of joint aches and pains, etc., then you know we would most likely try to rule out group one pulmonary hypertension, um, and you know we would have her do all of the testing required for that. If it's an older patient, if it's a 60-year-old man with heart failure, then a lot of the times it is because of the failing heart, and that's why they have pulmonary hypertension. So general principles of treatment, usually we have to address the secondary cause. So if their oxygen is low, we give them oxygen. If they have COPD, we try to treat the COPD. If somehow they have heart failure, we try to coordinate with their heart doctors to make sure that we um, address fluid retention and pulmonary edema. We address high blood pressure. Um, we also would like for patients who have pulmonary hypertension to have some sort of medication to help decompress the right side of the heart. And a lot of the times those are diuretics or medications that would make you pee extra. Um, patients who have ha very high heart rates also do poorly, so we want them to have a well-regulated heart rate. And then for patients who we know have either chronic clotting disorders, especially chronic clotting in the within the pulmonary vasculature, those who have chronic pulmonary embolism, we'd want them to be maintained on um, anticoagulation or blood thinners. The last one would be physical exercise and conditioning. Um, these patients actually do very well whenever we um, encourage them to actually exercise and, and participate in a formal exercise program. And these patients actually are helped by pulmonary rehabilitation as well. Um, and we would refer to them too. Yeah. There are certain types of medications that we give to patients who have pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, these are what we call pulmonary vasodilators. They usually relax the muscles within the arteries. They reduce the production of certain chemicals that promote vasoconstriction or um, thickening of the arteries within um, within the within the lungs, but you know th these medications are used primarily in group one pulmonary hypertension and group four pulmonary hypertension. Um, group one pulmonary hypertension, if you recall, are those patients who have pulmonary hypertension from um, either their autoimmune disease, those who have idiopathic meaning we don't really know why, but their pressures are elevated. So theoretically, um, these are only a small group of people. Um, those who have group four pulmonary hypertension, those who have chronic clotting disorders in the lungs, actually may also benefit too from these pulmonary vasodilator agents uh, and also may benefit from surgery. So people who have group four pulmonary hypertension tend to have bigger clots lodged within the, the larger pulmonary arteries. And when, that, when we see that, we actually refer them to uh, a surgeon, a thoracic surgeon, um, that can either suck out or open up the pulmonary artery and remove the pulmonary clot. Again, these are only for chronic thromboembolic diseases of the lungs um, and not for acute pulmonary embolism. Um, so this sort of gives a summary on um, what groups of patients actually have 
treatments uh, that actually work. So they're predominantly for group one and for group four. People who have pulmonary hy hypertension associated with lung disease due to low oxygen levels, or those who have heart issues, or those who have multifactorial um, medical issues such as chronic kidney disease, certain types of, of cancers, um, sarcoidosis, which is a kind of chronic inflammatory disorder. We don't really have specific treatments for designed specifically for pulmonary hypertension that can occur within that subgroup of, of patients. And that's why the general principle of treatment would apply to them. Make sure the right side of the heart is decompressed. If they have leg swelling, address the leg swelling. Diet and nutrition is something that I forgot to put into my slide, but that's very important. Limiting your salt intake, um, limiting your water intake if you do have to have some form of water restriction, um, and um, addressing the oxygen levels. Make sure that they're not hypoxemic. So that's sort of the end of my, the overview of what the common pulmonary vascular diseases are that we encounter. Um, I am open for questions if you have any. Yes, Paul. So there really are no new ones in the sense that we can use it across each class. The newer medications are for those who have group one or primary arterial pulmonary hypertension. A lot of, you know, a lot of these medications are now in the pill form, but for those who have severe types of pulmonary hypertension, those who have group four class where they can't even speak a sentence and you know they're not winded we usually treat them with more than just one drug we usually do triple treatment with two oral agents and either an inhaled or iv continuous iv medication for um, to help enlarge the size of the pulmonary arteries but you know looking at the group of people here a lot of the times if you do have pulmonary hypertension it's going to be secondary pulmonary hypertension and not primary and unfortunately there's not a lot of studies out there although i heard from my colleagues in the university that they are doing um, a study on pulmonary vasodilators and heart failure so we will see the studies are not out yet <coughs> Uh, yes, sir, the, the man well, in the vest. We get it, does it get when you are, um, you fit into two groups? So, yes, yeah, so, so I will actually say that patients really do not come with just one group. So typically they can come with two groups like they can fall into more than one group for sure. Because I mean, I see patients who have COPD, but at the same time have heart failure. Um, and so it's sort of good in that sense that they fall in a class where you really won't use any of the available pulmonary vasodilators. But um, unfortunately, the only thing that you can address are the secondary symptoms, uh, the, secondary, the secondary issue is to address the secondary issue. So make sure that the COPD is controlled, make sure that heart failure symptoms are controlled. Um, but um, as of now, there's no particular specific treatment for those groups of people. But you're correct that patients come in with more than falling into more than one class. Yes. The lady in pink, ma'am, we were asking. I have a question. Um, when you were talking about video packets, the mm -hmm. vascular disease, knowing that you can get the attributable known causative factors, is there any estimate of pollution, environmental pollution? Mm -hmm. So, so when it comes to pulmonary hypertension, those who have idiopathic disease usually are, usually, that's actually not, as far as we know, it's not usually related to any type of pollution or exposure. A lot of the times the people who have idiopathic disease usually come in very young. Um, they're usually women within the 35 to 50 age range. Um, and a lot of the times we feel the doctors and the scientists feel that this is mostly genetic, but we haven't really identified the genes that would promote that kind of disease. 
Did that answer your question? Okay. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. I have a question regarding sarcoidosis. Yes. How can it be that you can't breathe? You feel like you're suffocating, but yet your vitals are your vital signs are normal. Okay. So that's a question about shortness of breath. Essentially, so um, do realize that shortness of breath is different from low oxygen levels. You can be short of breath with having normal oxygen levels, but then you can have low oxygen levels but not feel short of breath. I have patients like that. Um, the reason is that the sensation of shortness of breath is very complex. It does not just rely on your oxygen levels or your carbon dioxide levels. It can also be due to muscular weakness. It can be from a fast heart rate. It can be from um, diaphragms and chest walls not, um, not contracting or functioning very well. So it really is more the, the, the sensation of shortness of breath is definitely more complex than having an abnormal vital sign. And patients who have sarcoid, um, if you want an example of sarcoidosis, a lot of the patients with sarcoid actually will have significant fatigue. And that's probably the most troublesome symptom in sarcoid because we really don't know how to address it. There's no pill for it, there's no medication for it. The only thing that we've found that helps is actually moderate as tolerated exercise. Um, and so, you know, part of the reason why we send people to pulmonary rehab and physical therapy is to help improve their strength and help improve that sensation of shortness of breath. Um, so that question, you know, the, the question of, well, why, am I, why are my vital signs normal? That's the common question we, we get asked in clinic. And unfortunately or fortunately, the body is a lot more complex than having one parameter go awry and you get shortness of breath. So how do you know whether you, you go, do you call 911 or do you go to the ER or you just write it out and hope you don't die? Well, it really depends, right? Because if you're actually dying, you're going to have other symptoms than shortness of breath. Your, your vital signs would definitely get affected. So the one thing you need to do is to actually slow down, drop whatever it is you're doing, sit down, catch your breath, if you have a pulse oximeter at home, use your pulse oximeter, see how low your oxygen levels go down to. If you don't feel any better after about 10 minutes of resting, then maybe it's time to go to the emergency room. Maybe it's more than just a sarcoid, maybe there's something else going on.